Hello and welcome to the module on qualitative research for OT 510. I'm Susan Magacy and I'll be facilitating this section of the course. In this session, we will be focusing on qualitative data collection. So once the research study is designed and you have selected your methodological approach, framed your research question, specified the details both of participant sampling and data gathering methods, you have to implement your plan. There are a lot of great resources and texts out there, and here are a few of my go-to references. Learning from Strangers is a great guide to how to conduct a qualitative interview, how to really listen to participants, and has good examples in there both of what to do and not not to do. Kruger and Casey's focus group guide, you have a couple of reading from a previous version of this, but it's excellent, really practical, really user-friendly. Ethnographer's Toolkit, seven volume item, walks you through all stages of design and data collection. And then Constructing Grounded Theory um, by Kathy Shermaz is um, just a classic if you're going to be doing grounded theory. Kathy Shermaz also is an occupational therapist by training. So all of these books provide a wealth of practical suggestions and insights to guide the qualitative data collection process. If you actually choose to do qualitative research, you'll build up your own library of relevant references and resources. But what's important to recognize is that there is a lot of ambiguity and challenges that can emerge in the field. And by having solid understandings of both the challenges and ways that others have worked through them can be really invaluable. In qualitative research, the researcher is considered a research tool. If you remember the core Q guidelines, that very first section of domain one is all about the positionality of the researcher. Who are they? What biases might they bring to the field? How do they position themselves relative to the research participants? How did they gain entry? What are they trying to accomplish? So all of these issues of skills, biases, as well as personal style are important considerations. Are you comfortable asking people questions and probing deeper into an issue? Are you good at sitting and observing and taking detailed notes? Or are you more of an engager and want to interact? Again, there's something to be said for playing to your strength in a research study, and all of these skills can be learned within the research context but they're important to recognize how our interactions and engagement in the field can influence the data collection process. There's also this issue of whether or not it's better to have a naive versus a content expert, um, interviewer, observer. And I like this quote by Marshall McLuhan that says, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't a fish. So the idea here being that if you're too close to a situation, it might be hard for you to notice some of the nuances. Um, one of the things the qualitative researcher is asked to do is make the, the usual seem strange or the ability to probe and ask questions. Well, why is it like that? What are the interconnections? Um, we don't want to go in completely naive, and nobody goes into the research setting completely naive. There's some reason that you're doing the study in the first place, but how much expertise, and even if you have expertise, when do you hold that, that back in an interview and let it be about the, the participant and their perspective? An interview is not about you showing what you know. It's about them exploring and expressing their worldview. So just a few tips on gathering qualitative data. Critical that you know your interview guide really well. Again, lots of preparation lets you be more flexible, especially if you're doing one of those semi-structured interviews where it doesn't really matter what order the questions are in, as long as you're getting at the key points and the key data. By knowing your interview guide well, 
It allows you to follow where the participant leads you while still being mindful of the information that you're trying to get. It also avoids you asking a question that they've maybe already answered, but answered in a different sequence and in a different way maybe than you had originally framed it. It also allows you to keep the conversation just more relaxed and natural, more conversational in tone. Um, important in the process to show interest, show interest in your topic, show interest in your participants. Um, there are verbal and nonverbal prompts and follow-ups that you can do to do this. Pay attention to nonverbal responses, both your own. Um, we are human. Um, and we all have emotional reactions, um, sometimes shock, sometimes disbelief, maybe sadness. Um, it's good to try to keep those in check to the extent possible. You don't want the interview to turn to be about you. You want to keep the focus on the person who you're interviewing, who you're observing or participating with. But you also want to be aware of the participants' nonverbal responses because these provide opportunities um, to probe, to pull somebody out, to get them, to ask them to engage. Um, and so they're important, important strategies. And also, yes, it's important to be flexible and let the interview err. No, the interviewee, sorry, um, leads you where they where the data goes. But you also know the boundaries of your study and what you're trying to look for. So it's important to be mindful of that and redirect people as appropriate. And this becomes a bit of a judgment call of when do you let them, um, when is it appropriate to explore and when is it just a little bit too far off track. So as qualitative research, it's important to be mindful of what the boundaries are on your inquiry. Now, this is very useful in both interviews and observation because it allows you to keep track of when the conversation or when the data collection is maybe going outside the boundaries of what you're interested in. It also provides protection for your research participants and other people in the social situation, particularly during observation, by having a very clear sense of what you consider data and what you don't consider data for your particular study. I also like the metaphor of the softball. And it emphasizes for me the importance in a qualitative data gathering of listening for understanding. If you're busy thinking about your next question or what has to come, come next or what your response should be, it will be easy to miss key elements. Our participants often throw up these, these sort of softballs, issues that are intriguing but they don't elaborate on, something that may be warrant a follow-up question. It's often when we're reading the transcript that we come across these softballs. Like, oh goodness, why didn't I follow up on that? That was such an interesting line of conversation. You can't hit them all. And honestly, you don't want to swing at them all either because some softballs are really things that are gonna, gonna lead you off, off the rails and distract you from the study. But it's a balance. But by listening for understanding, you have a better chance of hearing the nuances and following up on those leads. But here's another place where that ongoing and iterative process of analysis and data collection can come in handy. Maybe I missed the softball on the first go round, but I can follow up on it on the second interview or with the next participant. So really being mindful of what is said and also what is not said in an interview, in a focus group, can be a really important skill. And by using and actively engaging in that iterative process, um, it's helpful. A couple of other techniques that are very useful are the power of the pause. 
Um, just taking a break when you're talking and giving the participant both time to think and time to respond. Sometimes um, people are uncomfortable with silence. Both interviewers are uncomfortable with silence and feel like they need to fill in the space with chatter, um, but this doesn't always provide participants an opportunity to really carefully consider their answers. But also participants aren't always comfortable with silence. So if you can just take a break, a reticent participant might be more willing um, to add additional information because, you know, they also want to fill in that space. The probe is incredibly important, able to ask follow-up questions, clarifying questions, questions that allow you to get a deeper meaning and deeper understanding. And reflection and summary. So the probe and the reflection and summary together to really make sure that you're understanding what the participants are communicating. And when I do reflection, I always say, okay, this is what I think I'm hearing from you, but, you know, the tell me if I'm wrong. Um, because sometimes people, you know, they don't want to hurt your feelings or they, um, you know, think, oh gosh, you're the researcher, okay. Um, but that reflecting back allows you to do some member checking in the moment. If you want to do more member checking to ensure the rigor of your study, then you should, but this is a way of checking some of your preliminary findings and interpretations. Data recording, um, audio recording, and verbatim transcripts are the most common way of recording uh, focus groups so which, and interviews, which we then use for subsequent analysis. A field note is a descriptive summary of key observations used very often for observation type studies but can also be used at the end of an interview in a focus group and really serves as that first step in your analysis, begins creating that audit trail, and also just creates a really useful tool for communicating with other team members on emergent themes. They might not have time to read a whole 20 page transcript, but a page most people can, can read and, and process um, and give you meaningful feedback on. Reflective memos, is different than the, the more concrete field note. This is where you're really starting to flesh out some of your interpretation, some of the connections that you're starting to see across studies, some of those decision points where maybe you change course or make different decisions. So all three of them are data that can be analyzed and used in your analysis. And I want to say just a few words about ethics and emotions in research. We don't talk about this a lot, but deeply engaged research, qualitative research, um, can have unintended consequences, both on the participants, even though often we're just talking or hanging out and observing, our very presence in the, in the situation can, you know, have an impact on people. And it's important to be mindful of the footprint that you leave in research. And also, depending on the sensitivity of the topic, the nature of the interactions, research can also have an impact on the researcher. You know, we may be dealing with people who are dealing with um, difficult life situations, going through challenges or struggles. Um, and I don't think we should minimize the impact that that has on us as, as people. And there often are not mechanisms built into the study design to, to um, address that. One of the best studies that I've ever read on that topic is $100 and a Dead Man by Stephen Van Der Shea, who um, talks a lot about how small decisions that he made in the course of his field work had huge impacts on and unintended consequences on the people he was he was studying and working with. And it's uh, important to to think about ways that we can build in, again, going back to those boundaries, what is and what is not appropriate within the context of research? How do we as occupational therapists don our research hat 
or our um, or our clinician hat, and when is it appropriate to switch? Um, and also just building in mechanisms of support for the for the researcher. Um, make a plan, have a team, you know, build in some support and provide opportunities for debriefing, because being in close um, close contact with people who may be going through difficult times. Um, you know, it can be challenging. Now, not all qualitative research studies get at that level of emotionality, but depending on your topic, it might. And it's good to, again, think about it in advance so you can have a strategy in place. Hopefully you never need to use it, but if you do, it's there. So just in summary, in qualitative research, the researcher is considered part of the research process and a research tool. So it's important to position yourself and think about the impact that who you are has on the research process. Methods of data collection dictate what skills and strategies are required to manage the process. Um, and just in general, interest in organization, focus, flexibility, pre-planning, are all required to be a successful qualitative researcher and qualitative data collector.